Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. So turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. We're going to put it up on the screen. It says this. It says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I also would like you to look at Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 43. It says this, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at a table. I love that about Jesus. He says he reclined at a table. Look at someone next to you say, Jesus knew how to chill. That's amazing. My man is just like reclining, like hanging, hanging out. It says a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Okay, I'm going to have you repeat this too. Say sinful life. Put your hand on your heart. Say, I have lived a sinful life. Okay, so I want you to know this story is not about this, this lady. His story is about you. It's about me. We, are, we have lived sinful lives. Unless we are perfect, and we know that's not possible, the story's about us. It says, a woman who has lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume, a very expensive bottle containing extremely expensive perfume. I've heard some estimations about the contents of the perfume being worth up to a year's salary. So if you're here you know, right now and you make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year, imagine something so expensive that, the, that what's, the contents of the bottle are worth that much money. That's how valuable and expensive this perfume is. It says, and she stood behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them, poured it. When the Pharisee who had invited them saw this, he said to himself, okay, listen to this. He says to himself, that means he's thinking this. He says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that's a sinner. So this woman's got a reputation in town. A lot of theologians and people believe that she's a prostitute even. And this, this Pharisee is just turned off by this whole exhibit of all this uh, you know, over, t- over the top, taking this expensive perfume, pouring it on Jesus. He's just not impressed. This woman's a prostitute. She's a sinner. He's judging her. And he says this to himself. And verse 40 is a very modern verse. It says, And Jesus answered him like Professor X from X-Men and said, Simon, so it, no, it actually doesn't say the X-Men part, but I added that. The reason I say that is because like, this guy is thinking this to himself. He's thinking this woman is a sinner. Jesus doesn't know who he is. But Jesus answers him. He answers what he's saying in his head. And Jesus goes, Simon, I have something to tell you. He says, tell me, teacher. He says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. So just real quick, that means one person owed him $67,000. The other person owed him $6,700. Okay. It says, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. He said, so who is going to love the money lender more? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one that has the bigger debt forgiven. And then he says, you have judged correctly. Then he turns to the woman. Now remember, Jesus is like reclining. He's chilling, he's reading minds. Like he's, he's talking to the dude. He like puts the dude in his place with a serious story. He's like leaning, so he's talking to this dude. He looks at the woman who's pouring stuff on his feet, but he's still talking to homeboy over here. Have you ever had someone that's talking to you but not looking at you? Do you know how like that just like puts you in your place? So he looks at the woman, he goes, you see this woman? He's talking to dude right here. He goes, I came to your house. You didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, he still ain't looking at him. He says, I tell you, her sins, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgive, forgiven little, 
loves little. Then Jesus looked at her and he said, your sins are forgiven. Today, I got a message for you. It's called, forget it. Yeah, you can give the Lord a praise today. <clears throat> today, I got a message for you. It's called, forget it and let it go. Forget it and let it go. Forget it and let it go. Look at someone next to you. Say, forget it and let it go. Now, not in a creepy way, but touch five people real quick and say, forget it and let it go. Come on, five people. Say, forget it and let it go. Just real quick. Forget it and let it go. Father, we bless you today. Thank you for this opportunity to worship in your presence, to get into your word. I pray in Jesus' name this word will come alive, connect with every heart in this place. You transform us from the inside out. Uh, that it'd be obvious to people around us that we've been in your word, challenged by your word, because you can see the fruit of it changing us from the inside out. We thank you for that today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, what? Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, I heard a story about this young preacher. And uh, he went, it's an old story, but you know, he went to see this famous evangelist who packed out stadiums. And this guy was his hero. This guy was a phenomenal communicator great preacher of the gospel, and sometimes he was known to start his messages with a great story. So this kid is trying to, you know, follow his idol and his mentor and learn all the secrets of communication. So he's, he's coming ready to see, like, how does he start his messages? How does he craft his sermons? Uh, what's his style? So he's sitting there ready to write everything down. And uh, so all of a sudden, the guy comes out, the place is packed, thousands and thousands of people. And the guy comes out and looks at the crowd and he says, I have spent, some, this, the, the, the evangelist says, I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. So this is the first thing this guy says to this packed place. And then the place just goes completely silent, just like you are right now. <laughs> completely silent. So the preacher again says, I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. All of a sudden, women start getting up off the back row and like leaving. Like a guy gets up off the back row, starts leaving. And this kid is just baffled. And so one more time, he says, I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. And he says, my mother's arms. Okay, so hold on. <laughs> Then he goes on to preach this message on how we're quick to judge people before we get all the information. Uh, so, so this young man is just blown away. He's like, that's brilliant. He's like, I love that. He's like, I'm gonna use that someday. So, so he, he, he waits and he has, this, he has this story. He's gonna preach that same message. He just wants to put people in their place, let them know how judgmental they can be when they don't have all the information. So he gets the sermon together. He crafts it together. Years go by. He finally gets his big break. He doesn't even wanna tell his wife about it because he's so excited about impressing everyone. Place is packed. The energy's going on. They introduce him, his first sermon ever. And he wants to do the whole intro with no notes. He wants to memorize it because that's what the guy did. He doesn't wanna look at his notes at all. So he tries to memorize this whole thing and he gets up in front of the place. He delivers the first line. I've spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. The room goes silent just like it did with his mentor and his hero. He goes, yes, it's working. I've spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Ladies get up off the back row. A deacon gets up off the back row and storms out. He's like, I've got him in the palm of my hand. And then he goes, I, he's, now he looks at his wife and his wife gives him an evil look. And he gets nervous and he starts freaking out. And now he kind of he, he can't remember what he's doing right here. And he, he doesn't want to go back to his notes and he doesn't know what to do. He goes, I've spent some of the happiest moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. And all of a sudden he can't remember the punchline of the joke. <laughs> and he goes, I just can't remember who she is though. Yeah, that's the whole story. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I didn't, it's not a great story. It's just, uh, the, the point of it actually is that sometimes forgetting the past is a curse. Forgetting things is a curse sometimes. But sometimes forgetting things can be very good. It can be a blessing. And I think that in our lives as Christians, most of the time, we 
have trouble remembering the things that we should remember, but we also have trouble forgetting the things that we should forget. And I think sometimes that forgetting needs to be a discipline that we develop. We need to forget about the things that we should forget about. Sometimes remembering can really ruin your, your day. Like, have you ever been having a great day? Anyone ever woke up and you're just having a banging day? It's like, it's amazing. Like, you got, your coffee's great. You know, music is great. Song is great. You get out, the weather's fantastic. And you're walking along, you're like, why am I so happy right now? This is amazing. And then you remember something. I don't know what is it that you remember. Like, what it is is you remember. Maybe you remember, like, you've got a past due credit card bill. You're like, oh, great. Everything was awesome. And then, or, or you're like, oh, I got to go to that party tonight and I don't like anyone there. No one likes me or whatever it is. Sometimes it's interesting that we have the ability with our memories to bring back a lot of negative feelings or we have the ability to remember things that remind us of who we are supposed to be. And the problem with most of us is when we fail to forget the things that we are supposed to forget... It, ha- it gives us the inability to move into the next level of our life. And I'd like to tell you today, it is impossible for us to reach into the future if we refuse to let go of the past. It is impossible for us to reach into the future if we refuse to let go of the past. Now, I want to share something with you today that I just feel like the Lord just put this in my heart yesterday. Yesterday. I'm driving around and I just felt this coming to my heart. I'm going to share it to you exactly like God put it in my heart. Does anyone ever like going to the circus? Raise your hand if you like the circus. Come on, don't make me feel stupid here. I like the circus, all right? The circus is amazing. I like the peanuts, popcorn, cotton candy. I like the clowns. I like all, every aspect of the circus. I think is totally fun. But you know what my favorite thing about the circus is? Well, I do actually, I do like those motor, the, the cage of death or whatever. That's pretty cool too, uh, where they go, they, they're going like four motorcycles in one thing at one time. But my favorite thing about the circus has always been the flying trapeze. I love the flying trapeze. It's so, it's so uh, dangerous and it's so scary. As a matter of fact, one time Amy and I in horror, we were at a Cirque du Soleil show and actually saw uh, an, an act fall from like 50 feet with no net and like really, really hurt. They had to cancel the rest of the show. It was terrible. It was awful. But I mean, it shows you how real and the the risks that are involved with this kind of act. But what the Lord kind of put in my spirit about the trapeze, the flying trapeze act is the flying trapeze, the whole concept is it is, it's a trick or, or a skill or an act where you move from one trapeze to the other. And in order to move from one trapeze to the other, there is a particular moment where you have to be willing to go through what is called a transition. And if you're ever going to get From one trapeze to another, you have to be willing to go through an awkward moment. Is anyone here this morning? Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? You have to be willing to go through an awkward moment that is called a what? A transition. And a transition is the process or period of changing from one state or condition to another. The process of uh, or period of changing from one state or condition to another. And how many people know that it is impossible for you to get from the trapeze that you were on from this level to that level without doing what? Come on, look at someone next to you say, I guess the answer. <laughs> it's impossible for you to get from one place to another without fully letting go. And it's really important for you to understand that a transition is not supposed to be a season. A transition is a space that God has designated to put in between two seasons. You're not ever supposed to get used to a transition. You're not ever supposed to settle for the way life is during a transition because a transition is supposed to be temporary. Somebody say temporary. And I think what the problem is, is we've got people that are living in the kingdom of God stuck between two seasons. They're lost in transition 
They're lot, they're stuck between two seasons. And what's happened is, is they've tried to time it. They've, they've seen that they've, they're swinging back and forth and oh, here it comes. And oh my gosh, it takes so, whoo, there it is again. Oh, it takes so much faith. Help me God, here I go, no! And, and, and you kind of get to the edge and you get nervous. And I think sometimes people have let go of one and reached out and grabbed the other and here you are. Now what do you do? You're stuck. You're stuck between two seasons. Look at someone next to you and say, that's a problem. I was thinking that when you're stuck between two of them things, I've seen that before on that show. What's that show called? American Ninja Warriors. You ever seen them people on American Ninja Warriors, they get stuck between two of them things, what do they do? They start going... They try to build up momentum, but they can't do it. And all they do is they rock back and forth. And the problem is when you're, when you're stuck in between two seasons, you try to create momentum in your life. And you might move forward just a little bit. But the problem is, is unless you let go of this thing over there, you're going to go back. That's why a lot of Christians make progress in their life. That's why a lot of Christians will make progress in their life and God will do something brand new in your life. God will give you a new revelation. He'll take you to a new height, but you're not willing to let go of the old season in your life so that even though you might go forward, you have still anchored yourself to the old season. And I gotta tell you something, transitions are not meant for hanging around. Transitions are moments where you're supposed to completely let yourself go. And that feeling, I mean, I don't know if you've ever dived off a diving board before or, or jumped off a, a cliff, you know, in, 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 in waters where, where people dive that are deep enough and you can jump. And I, I was one time, you know, down in South America and there, there, there was this cliff and it's, it's huge and people are jumping off. And I was with people, I was with some people that couldn't do it. And I, I understand that because uh, there's, there's a lot of times people have a fear of, of heights. But I mean, I got up there and I just went, woo, you know, I just jumped off. It was fun. I, had a, I thought it was great. But, you know, I didn't try to grab the rock or something halfway down. And, and I certainly didn't try to build a camp, you know, halfway down and stop and then, you know, just so, sort of camp out there and live. Why? Because that's supposed to be a transition. It's supposed to be from one place to another. And the problem is, is when you build your life in between two seasons and you've convinced yourself that that is the season, you've missed it. Some people have turned the transition into a season. Therefore, you're stuck in a transition. It's impossible to reach for the future when you refuse to let go of the past. See, Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 19 says, see, I am doing a what? Come on. It says, see, I am doing a what? Come on, say it. See, I am doing a what? Come on, it's a new thing. That means that, that means Holy Spirit, and I love it, is that when you rely on the timing of God, he will prepare you for the transition. He will show you what it feels like to create timing. And you know what? It's okay when you come up to that thing and you're watching, and it takes a leap of faith. And it's a lot. Last week I talked about all-in moments. This is, about, this is about how you do that. This is about how you let go to go all-in. The Holy Spirit will help you understand the timing of transition, that you've got to learn what it feels like. You've got to get some confidence that when it, you know, okay, wait, now here it comes, here it comes, let me build my momentum. And, and there comes a couple of times where maybe you don't do it at the perfect time. But then finally, when you go all in and you let go, you know what you feel like in a transition? Now I'm free. Freefall. You're like, is this white people music? What is he singing? What is he singing? It's Tom Petty. It's actually a really good song. You listen to that song. It's, it's a free fall. A transition is a moment where you let go and you're soaring through the air. And man, what a feeling that is to, to truly let go, to let go of your past. You know, and I think the problem is you say, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? Give me an example. Look, maybe you're the kind of person that likes to fight and argue and, and, and yell at your family and, and throw things and break things and, and cuss people out. And, 
and bang on steering wheels and, you know, go out and your kids are upstairs and they're all freaked out and because you're yelling and fussing and fighting, you've created an atmosphere of tension and you go out and sleep in your car or something all night. And, uh, you know, maybe you do that, but maybe you're also the kind of person that comes to church. Now, look, I'm not criticizing you saying stop coming to church. I'm, I'm not here to call you a hypocrite. But I'm saying what happens is I think that when you live like that, I believe that you're stuck. And I believe what's happening is you're, you're, you're coming to church and you're going, yes, it feels good to, to, to praise the Lord. It feels good to be in church with my family. It feels good to find out about this new life that God has called me to. But what happens is instead of letting go of the old life and the, the, the way your family used to live, the way you used to be before you knew Christ, instead of letting all that go and say, I'm tired of that, you settle for holding on to that and you swing back the other way. Who's ready today? Who's ready to, who's tired of that old life? Who's ready to say, I want to let go of the old. I want to take that leap. I want to fly through the air. I want to feel, I want to feel what it feels like to take a risk again and to go all in for God. I, I'm tired of holding on to a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. And can I tell you something? It doesn't work. Some of the, some of the advice that I give over and over and over to people is stop doing things that don't work. When is the last time, when is the last time, I mean, you say, what does that mean? When is the last time that you have pointed at someone and said, nobody's going to talk to me like that, that they went, I get it now, yes, sir. <laughs> Never. All that kind of stuff does is breed more resentment in people. You have, to, you have to live with character and you have to let the fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in every single area of your life over a period of time where people can see what has developed in you. That's what causes people to respect you and honor you over time. Not just pointing your finger or screaming or, I mean, when's the last time you, you know, threw a dish at someone and they go, now I realize I love you. Or, or you know, what, what, it doesn't work. These things don't work. Stop doing things that don't work. It's time to let go. It's time to go into a transition and then move into that new season and transitions. Listen, if, if, don't miss what I'm saying here, because actually sometimes transitions can be long time wise. OK, but that doesn't mean that that's the season that God has intended you, for you for the rest of your life. Sometimes the period of transitions can be long. I know that I, uh, with my, my mom and dad, I was the co-pastor of City of Life for five years. Uh, and, and my dad had a great plan. He said, I would, like, I would like you to help me. So five years, we're, we've, Pastor Amy and I have been senior pastors for 10 years. Well, 15 years ago, Dad said, I would like you to help me for two and a half years implement the things that I want to do. And he said, be my right-hand guy. He said, and then I will help you for two and a half years while I'm still the pastor. I will help you do the things that you feel like God has called you to do to help steer the church. And then at that point, I'm going to hand it over and I want you to take over. That was a five-year period that was a transition period. And during that five years, you could say, oh, well, that's a season. Well, it was a, it was a transition is what it actually was. It was taking me out of one area into a brand new area. And it felt like transition that whole time. And then now, this is 10 years of a season of my life that I've been growing into. And it's, a, it's great. And you know what? There's a new season that's ahead of me. And there's going to be some transition that is ahead of me that I've got to be willing. And if I am trying to live my life pre-senior pastor Jeff uh, with one hand back in the past over here and one hand on what I've got control of right now, I'm just going to get myself stuck. We have to be willing to let go. And I love this story about this woman. Because I love the fact that she sees the life that she can have and she sees the old life that she just came out of and she brings something that is from her old life that she can use as an example of the fact that she's done with that old life completely. Because it says she brings with her this alabaster jar of perfume. And a lot of people that say that this woman was a prostitute would say that this represented her work and it represented, you know, that, that perfume is what got her certain jobs and, uh, you know, the value that's placed on it being worth a year's salary, uh, that, that it's something that is precious so much so that the people in the room said, what is this woman doing? This is expensive stuff. We could sell this and give this to the poor. So, I mean, people knew and were aware of the value of what she was doing and what she was doing is she was making a statement to Jesus 
I just came out of sin. That is the old season. I am tired of that old season. I don't want to hold on to grace with one hand and sin with another. I'm bringing my past. Here it is. I'm going to break this jar at your feet. Everything of value that could tie me to my past and keep me relying on yesterday, I'm going to destroy it so I can go all in with this new life that you have called me to. Look at someone next to you say, you might have to bust up your old life. You break it so it's unusable. That's what she was doing. She was saying, I'll be tempted to live off this money. I'll be tempted to live off this resource, to live off this way of life if I keep it around, so I'm gonna break it. I'm gonna let go, I'm gonna free fall. And God, you're going to have, and you know what? I'm going to a place called grace. And when I finally get there, I'm going to hold on with everything I have. And I'm not letting go. I'm, I'm going from sin to grace. She's a sinner. She's a flat out sinner. And I love the fact that she just exits sin and she enters a season. She exits a season called sin and she enters a season called grace just like that. I love the fact that she broke that jar. That's, that's the Greek word, sin tribo, to break, to bruise, broken into pieces. And I feel like there's some people here today that you need to break the season of your old life. You need to break it up. It's time for you to stop being stuck between two seasons. It's, it's time for you to stop being stuck in a transition and to fully, you know, we need to stop ending chapters of our lives with question marks that need to be ended with a period. Can I tell you something about your past? Can I tell you something about your past without being too painful? Can I? It is what it is. I'm about to come tell every section. This sounds insensitive, but can I tell you something about these terrible mistakes that you've made? Can I tell you something about the, the horrible pain that you've experienced? It is what it is. God is not going to erase it. We want him to. That's what we want. We so want God to, to erase it so it never happened. We don't want the memory of it. We don't want the feelings of it. We don't want the shame of it. We don't want the guilt of it. And it would be so much easier if he could just erase it. But he doesn't need to erase it. You know why? Because he didn't choose to erase it. He chose to redeem it. He redeemed it. That means he took it and he made it new. He took all the pain, all the hurt, all the things that were meant to kill you, the things that were meant to destroy you, the things that were meant to break you, the things that were meant to, to end you, to end your future. He took all of those things and he redeemed it with his son, Jesus. He gave you, you value. He gave you hope. And do you know how bad it hurts God? when he is presenting that new season of your life. And, I be, and I'm just saying this prophetically right now, there are people in this room, and if you will receive this and jump onto this, and I didn't say it to the first service, and I, I mean it for them in Jesus' name, but I'm saying it to you right now. But I believe if your heart is ready for this, you should hold on to this. There are people in this room that if you are willing, if you are willing to let go right now, that 12 months from now, you won't recognize your life. 12 months from now, you won't recognize your life. 12 months from now, I just, and, and you say, why are you saying that? Because I feel that in my spirit. I feel that God wants to do something so beautiful and so wonderful in your life. It's not that you won't remember your life. You will remember it, okay? But you know what? It's in a different way. When Paul says forgetting those things which are behind, he doesn't mean, whoa, I can't remember where I was last month. No, that doesn't mean that. What Paul is saying is I don't think anymore about the fact that I used to be a murderer. What he's saying is, I remember that I was a murderer, but I don't let the guilt and the shame from that hold me back any longer. I don't think about the fact that I used to live in a bigger house when I was profiting off of everyone else. I don't think about the fact that I used to drive a nice car and do all that stuff before, and maybe I don't have as much as I do. I don't let those things have power over me before. Why? Because that was a different season. And I let go of that season and I traded it for a better one. Okay, and, and, and you gotta remember something. When Jesus was talking to his disciples about all the stuff that they had left behind, they said, we've left everything for you. 
He said, I'm gonna tell you something. You may think you have left something, but nobody who has abandoned their houses, their families, their money, their wealth, anything they have, nobody in the big scheme of things is gonna have lost anything. All they will have done is gained everything. What you have lost is so minuscule compared to what you will gain for selling all out for Jesus. And I just, I believe it in Jesus' name. I believe it in Jesus' name. I believe it is time. Here you go. Are you ready? Okay, here it comes. Oh no, not this time. You know, it reminds me of my, my gorgeous daughter here on the front row. Man, I love her. And I remember, I remember that feeling of when, when she, was, uh, she was learning how to swim. She was so little. She was, I mean, she was, was she a year old, 12 months old? She could barely even walk, but she's learning how to swim. And um, I remember she'd been to a couple of lessons and we got in the pool and I stood her up by the side of the pool. I said, come on, baby. I said, jump into daddy. And she went, I was like, come on, come on, come on, punky, jump in, it's daddy, come on, jump to daddy. She went, I could not get this girl to jump in the pool. Well, I don't know what happened. One day she got in one of those lessons and she just figured out something. She figured out, I'm going to be able to jump in and I'm going to be scared for a minute, but I'm going to be okay because I can swim. See, and that's what happens is when you get in that moment with God where you see that transition coming and you're so scared. You're so scared to let go of the way you used to talk. You're so scared to let go of the way you used to think. You're so scared to tear down the idols that have ruled your life for so long. All the things that you have run to in your time of trouble. You're so scared to, to throw away the alcohol, to throw away the drugs, to throw away the numbers that you went to for booty calls in the past before God redeemed you. You're so scared of deleting contacts out of your phone. You're so scared of doing all the things that you used to do that led you back to the same trouble over and over and over. I know that it's a tough feeling, but what happens is when you finally get to the point where you're sick of that old life and you realize that God is big enough and good enough, you're going to be on that edge someday and God is going to look at you and say, come on, come on, I know you can do it. And you're just going to go, here I go. And you're just going to jump and you're just going to let go. And you know what? I believe that's today. I believe that's today. And I believe that a lot of people tried to write this woman off. We saw a guy that did it right in front of Jesus. He said, don't you realize that's a sinner? I believe a lot of people want to write you off today. Say that you're a lost cause. You know why? I believe that a lot of people are pointing the finger at you saying, really them? They're stuck in between two seasons. They've been stuck in a transition for 10 years. No, I mean, they're not out, you know, they're not out doing the worst things in the world. They're not killing anyone, but they don't do anything for God. They never recovered from that divorce. They never recovered from, you know, their, their father's death. They're stuck. So what happens is you become a lost cause. Not because you're this prodigal son, but just because you've never been to get, able to get out from between two seasons. But I believe today in Jesus' name, it's time for some of us to break that alabaster jar. I believe today it's time for us to take that valuable thing from the past and to break it in Jesus' feet. And I believe it's time for some of us to stand on that ledge. And, and you know what? Once this girl jumped in, it's crazy. I mean, I'd, I'd run out there and she'd be jumping in without me in the pool. I'm like, no, you're not allowed to do that. It, it just builds a confidence in you because you know your father's not gonna let you go. You know your father's not gonna let you fall. So today, um, today I invite you. I love that story of the woman at the well. John chapter four, verse 28. She came there with, with a jar to put water in. But after she met Jesus, the Bible says, then leaving her water jar, the, women went back, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, dot, dot, dot. The, the very thing she came with, she's like, I forgot why I even came. I met Jesus, it changed everything. I believe there's some people here that need to leave your jar here. I believe there's some people here today that you need to break your alabaster jar. You need to take that value from your past. You just need to crush it and say, I'm all in today in the name of Jesus. This concludes the teaching. 
If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.